You are listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of Paycheck by Philip K. Dick. Part one of three. Performed by Miranda Johnson. Rhetoric Construction hired Jennings for two years. When he left, they erased his memory. This annoyed him, but not half as much as his paycheck. All at once, he was in motion. Around him, smooth jets hummed. He was on a small private rocket cruiser, moving leisurely across the afternoon sky between cities. Ugh, he said, sitting up in his seat and rubbing his head. Beside him, Earl Rethrick was staring keenly at him, his eyes bright. Coming around? Where are we? Jennings shook his head, trying to clear the dull ache. Or maybe I should ask that a different way. Already he could see that it was not late fall. It was spring. Below the cruiser, the fields were green. The last thing he remembered was stepping into the elevator with Rethrick. And it was late fall. And in New York. Yes, Rethrick said. It's almost two years later. You'll find a lot of things have changed. The government fell a few months ago. The new government is even stronger. The SP, security police, have almost unlimited power. They're teaching the school children to inform now. But we all saw that coming. Let's see, what else? New York is larger. I understand they've finished filling in San Francisco Bay. What I want to know is what the hell I've been doing the last two years. Will you tell me that? No. Of course I won't tell you that. Where are we going? Back to the New York office. Where you first met me. Remember? You probably remember it better than I. After all, it was just a day or so ago for you. Two years. Two years out of his life, gone forever. It didn't seem possible. He still had been considering, debating when he stepped on the elevator. Should he change his mind? Even if he were getting that much money, and it was a lot, even for him, it didn't really seem worth it. He would always wonder what work he had been doing. Was it legal? Was it... But that was past speculation now. Even while he was trying to make up his mind, the curtain had fallen. He looked ruefully out the window at the afternoon sky. Below, the earth was moist and alive. Spring. Spring two years later. And what did he have to show for the two years? Have I been paid? He asked. He slipped his wallet out and glanced into it. Apparently not. No. You'll be paid at the office. Kelly will pay you. Fifty thousand credits. Jennings smiled. He felt a little better now that the sum had been spoken aloud. Maybe it wasn't so bad after all. Almost like being paid to sleep. But he was two years older. He had just that much less to live. It was like selling part of himself, part of his life. And life was worth plenty these days. He shrugged. Anyhow, it was in the past. We're almost there, the older man said. The robot pilot dropped the cruiser down, sinking towards the ground. The edge of New York City became visible below them. Well, Jennings, I may never see you again. He held out his hand. It's been a pleasure working with you. We did work together, you know, side by side. You're one of the best mechanics I've ever seen. We were right in hiring you, even at that salary. You paid us back many times, although you didn't realize it. I'm glad you got your money's worth. You sound angry. No, I'm just trying to get used to the idea of being two years older. Rethrick laughed. You're still a very young man. And you'll feel better when she gives you your pay. 
They stepped out onto the tiny, rooftop field of the New York office building. Rethrick led him over to an elevator. As the doors slid shut, Jennings got a mental shock. This was the last thing he remembered. This elevator. After that, he had blacked out. Kelly will be glad to see you, Rethrick said, as they came out into a lighted hall. She asks about you once in a while. Why? She says you're good looking. Rethrick pushed a code key against a door. The door responded, swinging wide. They entered the luxurious office of Rethrick Construction. Behind a long mahogany desk, a young woman was sitting, studying a report. Kelly, Rethrick said. Look whose time finally expired. The girl looked up, smiling. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. How does it feel to be back in the world? Fine. Jenkins walked over to her. Rethrick says you're the paymaster? Rethrick clapped Jenkins on the back. So long, my friend. I'll go on back to the plant. If you ever need a lot of money in a hurry, come around and we'll work out another contract with you. Jennings nodded. As Rethrick went back out, he sat down beside the desk, crossing his legs. Kelly slid a drawer open, moving her chair back. All right, your time is up, so Rethrick Construction is ready to pay. Do you have your copy of the contract? Jennings took an envelope from his pocket and tossed it on the desk. Kelly removed a small cloth sack and some sheets of handwritten paper from a desk drawer. For a time, she read over the sheets, her small face intent. What is it? I think you're going to be surprised. Kelly handed him his contract back. Read that over again? Why? Jennings unfastened the envelope. There's an alternate clause. If the party of the second part so desires, at any time during his time of contract to the aforesaid Rethrick Construction Company, Jennings found the clause. So? If he so desires, instead of the monetary sum specified, he may choose instead, according to his own wish, articles or products, which, in his own opinion, are of sufficient value to stand in lieu of the sum. Jennings snatched up the cloth sack, pulling it open. He poured the contents into his palm. Kelly watched. Where's Rethrick? Jennings stood up. If he has an idea that this, Rethrick had nothing to do with it. It was your own request. Here, look at this. Kelly passed him the sheets of paper. In your own hand. Read them. It was your idea, not ours. Honest. She smiled up at him. This happens every once in a while with people we take on contract. During their time, they decide to take something else instead of money. Why, I don't know. But they come out with their minds clean. Jennings scanned the pages. It was his own writing. There was no doubt of it. His hands shook. I can't believe it. Even if it is my own writing. He folded up the paper, his jaw set. Something was done to me while I was back there. I never would have agreed to this. You must have had a reason. I admit it doesn't make sense, but you don't know what factors might have persuaded you before your mind was cleaned. You aren't the first. There have been several others before you. Jennings stared down at what he held in his palm. From the cloth sack, he had spilled a little assortment of items. A code key, a ticket stub, a parcel receipt, a length of fine wire, half a poker chip, broken across, a green strip of cloth, and a bus token. This, instead of fifty thousand credits, he murmured, two years. He went out of the building onto the busy afternoon street. 
He was still dazed, dazed and confused. Had he been swindled? He felt in his pocket at the little trinkets, the wire, the ticket stub, all the rest. That for two years of work? But he had seen his own handwriting, the statement of waiver, the request for the substitution. Like Jack and the Beanstalk. Why? What for? What had made him do it? He turned, staring down the sidewalk. At the corner, he stopped for a surface cruiser that was turning. All right, Jenkins, get in. His head jerked up. The door of the cruiser was open. A man was kneeling, pointing a heat rifle straight at his face. A man in blue-green. The security police. Jennings got in. The door closed, magnetic locks slipping into place behind him. Like a vault. The cruiser glided off down the street. Jennings sank back against the seat. Beside him, the SP man lowered his gun. On the other side, a second officer ran his hands expertly over him, searching for weapons. He brought out Jennings' wallet and the handful of trinkets, the envelope and contract. What does he have? The driver said. Wallet, money, contract with Rethrit Construction, no weapons. He gave Jennings back his things. What's this all about? Jennings said. We want to ask you a few questions. That's all. You've been working for Rethrick? Yes. Two years? Almost two years. At the plant. Jennings nodded. I suppose so. The officer leaned toward him. Where is that plant, Mr. Jennings? Where is it located? I don't know. The two officers looked at each other. The first one moistened his lips, his face sharp and alert. You don't know. The next question. The last. In those two years, what kind of work did you do? What was your job? Mechanic. I repaired electronic machinery. What kind of electronic machinery? I don't know. Jennings looked up at him. He could not help smiling, his lips twisting ironically. I'm sorry, but I don't know. It's the truth. There was silence. What do you mean, you don't know? You mean you worked on machinery for two years without knowing what it was? Without even knowing where you were? Jennings roused himself. What is all this? What did you pick me up for? I haven't done anything. I've been... We know. We're not arresting you. We only want to get information for our records. About Rethrick Construction. You've been working for them in their plant. You're an electronic mechanic? Yes. You repair high-quality computers and allied equipment. The officer consulted his notebook. You're considered one of the best in the country, according to this. Jennings said nothing. Tell us the two things we want to know, and you'll be released at once. Where is Rethrick's plant? What kind of work are they doing? You serviced their machines for them, didn't you? Isn't that right? For two years? I don't know. I suppose so. I don't have any idea what I did during those two years. You can believe me or not. Jennings stared warily down at the floor. What'll we do? The driver said finally. We have no instructions past this. Take him to the station. We can't do any more questioning here. Beyond the cruiser, men and women hurried along the sidewalk. The streets were choked with cruisers, workers going to their homes in the country. Jennings, why don't you answer us? What's the matter with you? 
There's no reason why you can't tell us a couple of simple things like that. Don't you want to cooperate with your government? Why should you conceal information from us? I'd tell you if I knew. The officer grunted. No one spoke. Presently, the cruiser drew up before a great stone building. The driver turned the motor off, removing the control cap and putting it in his pocket. He touched the door with the code key, releasing the magnetic lock. What shall we do? Take him in? Actually, we don't... Wait! The driver stepped out. The other two went with him, closing and locking the doors behind them. They stood on the pavement before the security station, talking. Jennings sat silently, staring down at the floor. The SP wanted to know about Rethrick construction. Well, there was nothing he could tell them. They had come to the wrong person. But how could he prove that? The whole thing was impossible. Two years wiped clean from his mind. Who would believe him? It seemed unbelievable to him, too. His mind wandered back to when he had first read the ad. It had hit home, hit him direct. Mechanic wanted, and a general outline of the work, vague, indirect, but enough to tell him that it was right up his line. Interviews at the office, tests, forms, and then the gradual realization that Rethrick Construction was finding all about him while he knew nothing about them. What kind of work did they do? Construction, but what kind? What sort of machines did they have? 50,000 credits for two years. And he had come out with his mind washed clean. Two years, and he remembered nothing. It took him a long time to agree to that part of the contract. But he had agreed. Jennings looked out the window. The three officers were still talking on the sidewalk, trying to decide what to do with him. He was in a tough spot. They wanted information he could not give. Information he did not know. But how could he prove it? How could he prove that he had worked two years and come out knowing no more than when he had first gone in? The SP would work him over. It would be a long time before they believe him. And by that time... He glanced quickly around. Was there any escape? In a second, they would be back. He touched the door, locked, the triple ring magnetic locks. He had worked on magnetic locks many times. He had even designed part of a trigger core. There was no way to open the doors without the right code key. Unless by some chance he could short out the lock. But with what? He felt in his pockets. What could he use? If he could short out the locks, blow them out, there was a faint chance. Outside, men and women were swarming by on their way home from work. It was past five. The great office buildings were shutting down. The streets were alive with traffic. If he could get out, they wouldn't dare fire. If he could get out. The three officers separated. One went up the steps into the station building. In a second, the others would re-enter the cruiser. Jennings dug into his pocket, bringing out the code key, the ticket stub, the wire. The wire! Thin wire, thin as a human hair. Was it insulated? He unwound it quickly. No. He knelt down, running his fingers expertly across the surface of the door. At the edge of the lock was a thin line, a groove between the lock and the door. He brought the end of the wire up to it, delicately maneuvering the wire into the almost invisible space. The wire disappeared an inch or so. Sweat rolled down Jennings' forehead. He moved the wire a fraction of an inch, twisting it. He held his breath. The relay should be... A flash. Half-blinded, he threw his weight against the door. The door fell open, the lock fused and smoking. Jennings tumbled into the street and leaped to his feet. Cruisers were all around him, honking and sweeping past. He ducked behind a lumbering truck, 
entering the middle lane of traffic. On the sidewalk, he caught a momentary glimpse of the SP men starting after him. A bus came along, swaying from side to side, loaded with shoppers and workers. Jennings caught hold of the back rail, pulling himself up onto the platform. The robot conductor was coming toward him, whirring angrily. Sir, the conductor began. The bus was slowing down. Sir, it is not allowed. It's all right, Jennings said. He was filled all at once with a strange elation. A moment ago he had been trapped with no way to escape. Two years of his life had been lost for nothing. The security police had arrested him, demanding information he could not give. A hopeless situation. But now, things were beginning to click in his mind. He reached into his pocket and brought out the bus token. He put it calmly into the conductor's coin slot. Okay, he said. Under his feet, the bus wavered, the driver hesitating. Then the bus resumed pace, going on. The conductor turned away, its whirs subsiding. Everything was all right. Jennings smiled. He had eased past the standing people, looking for a seat, some place to sit down where he could think. He had plenty to think about. His mind was racing. The bus moved on, flowing with the restless stream of urban traffic. Jennings only half saw the people sitting around him. There was no doubt of it. He had not been swindled. It was on the level. The decision had actually been his. Amazingly, after two years of work, he had preferred a handful of trinkets, instead of $50,000 credits. But more amazingly, the handful of trinkets were turning out to be worth more than money. With a piece of wire and a bus token, he had escaped from the security police. That was worth plenty. Money would have been useless to him once he disappeared inside the great stone station. Even 50,000 credits wouldn't have helped him. And there were five trinkets left. He felt around in his pocket, Five more things. He had used two. The others, what were they for? Something as important? But the big puzzle. How had he, his earlier self, known that a piece of wire and a bus token would save his life? He had known all right, known in advance. But how? And the other five... Probably they were just as precious, or would be. The he of those two years ago had known things that he did not know now, things that had been washed away when the company cleaned his mind, like a computer which had been cleared. Everything was slate clean. What he had known was gone now, gone except for several trinkets five of which were still in his pocket. But the real problem right now was not a problem of speculation. It was very concrete. The security police were looking for him. They had his name and description. There was no use thinking of going to his apartment, even if he still had an apartment. But where, then? Hotels? The SP combed them daily. Friends? That would mean putting them in jeopardy, along with him. It was only a question of time before the SP found him, walking along the street, eating in a restaurant, in a show, sleeping in the same rooming house. The SP were everywhere. Everywhere? Not quite. Where an individual person was defenseless, business was not. The big economic forces had managed to remain free, although virtually everything else had been absorbed by the government. Laws that had been eased away from the private person still protected property and industry. The SP could pick up any given person, but they could not enter and seize a company, a business. That had clearly been established at the beginning of the century. Businesses, industry, corporations were all safe from the security police, Due process was required. 
Rethrick Construction was a target of SP interest, but they could do nothing until some statue were violated. If he could get back to the company, get inside its doors, he would be safe. Jennings smiled grimly. The modern church, sanctuary. It was the government against the corporations, rather than the state against the church. The new Notre Dame of the world, where the law could not follow. Would Rethrick take him back? Yes, on the old basis. He had already said so. Another two years sliced from him, and then back into the streets. Would that help him? He felt suddenly in his pocket, and there were the remaining five trinkets. Surely he, the old he, had intended them to be used. No, he would not go back to Rethrick and work another contract time. Something else was indicated. Something more permanent. Jennings pondered. Rethrick Construction. What did it construct? What had he, the old he, known and figured out during those two years? And why were the SP so interested? He brought out the five objects and studied them. The green strip of cloth, the code key, the ticket stub, the parcel receipt, the half poker chip. Strange that little things like this could be important. And Rethrick Construction was involved. There was no doubt. The answer, all the answers, lay at Rethrick. But where was Rethrick? He had no idea where the plant was. No idea at all. He knew where the office was, the big, luxurious room with the young woman at her desk. But that was not Rethrick Construction. Did anyone know besides Rethrick? Kelly didn't know. Did the SP know? It was out of town. That was certain. He had gone there by rocket. It was probably in the United States, but in the farmlands, the country between cities. What a hell of a situation. Any moment the SP might pick him up. The next time he might not get away. His only chance, his only real chance for safety, lay in reaching Rethrick. And his only chance to find out the things he had to know. The plant. A place where he had been, but which he could not recall. He looked down at the five trinkets. Would any of them help? A burst of despair swept through him. Maybe it was just a coincidence, the wire and the token. Maybe... He examined the parcel receipt, turning it over and holding it up to the light. Suddenly, his stomach muscles nodded. His pulse changed. He had been right. No, it was not a coincidence, the wire and the token. The parcel receipt was dated two days hence. The parcel, whatever it might be, had not even been deposited yet. Not for 48 more hours. He looked at the other things. The ticket stub. What good was a ticket stub? It was creased and bent, folded over and over again. He couldn't go any place with that. A stub didn't take you anywhere. It only told you where you had been. Where you had been. He bent down, peering at it, smoothing the creases. The printing had been torn through the middle. Only half of each word could be made out. He smiled. That was it. Where he had been. He could fill in the missing letters. It was enough. There was no doubt. He, the old he, had foreseen this too. Three of the seven trinkets used. Four left. Stewartsville, Iowa. Was there such a place? He looked out the window of the bus. The inner city rocket station was only a block away. He could be there in a second. A quick sprint from the bus, hoping the police wouldn't be there to stop him. But somehow he knew they wouldn't. Not with the other four things in his pocket. And once he was on a rocket, he would be safe. Inner city was big. Big enough to keep free of the SP. 
Jennings put the remaining trinkets back into his pocket and stood up, pulling the bell cord. A moment later, he stepped gingerly out onto the sidewalk. The rocket led him off at the edge of town, a tiny brown field. A few disinterested porters moved about, stacking luggage, resting from the heat of the sun. Jennings crossed the field to the waiting room, studying the people around him. Ordinary people, working men, businessmen, housewives. Stewartsville was a small Midwestern town. Truck drivers, high school kids. He went through the waiting room, out onto the street. So this was where Rethrick's plant was located. Perhaps, if he had used the stub correctly. Anyhow, something was here, or he wouldn't have included the stub with the other trinkets. Stewartsville, Iowa. A faint plan was beginning to form in the back of his mind, still vague and nebulous. He began to walk, his hands in his pockets, looking around him. A newspaper office, lunch counters, hotels, pool rooms, a barber shop, a television repair shop, a rocket sales store with huge showrooms of gleaming rockets, family-sized, and, at the end of the block, the Portella Theater. The town thinned out. Farms, fields, miles of green country. In the sky above, a few transport rockets lumbered, carrying farm supplies and equipment back and forth. A small, unimportant town, just right for rhetoric construction. The plant would be lost here, away from the city, away from the SP. Jennings walked back. He encountered a lunchroom, Bob's place. A young man with glasses came over as he sat down at the counter, wiping his hands on the white apron. Coffee? Jennings said. The man brought the cup. There were only a few people in the lunchroom. A couple of flies buzzed against the window. Outside in the street, shoppers and farmers moved leisurely by. Say, Jennings said, stirring his coffee. Where can a man get work around here? Do you know? What kind of work? The young man came back, leaning against the counter. Electrical wiring. I'm an electrician. Television, rockets, computers, that sort of stuff. Why don't you try the big industrial areas? Uh, Detroit, Chicago, New York? Jennings shook his head. Can't stand the big cities. I never liked cities. The young man laughed. A lot of people here would be glad to work in Detroit. Are there any plants around here? Any repair shops? None that I know of. The young man went off to wait on some men that had come in. Jennings sipped his coffee. Had he made a mistake? Maybe he should go back and forget about Stewartsville, Iowa. Maybe he had made the wrong inference from the ticket stub. But the ticket meant something unless he was completely wrong about everything. It was a little late to decide that, though. The young man came back. Is there any kind of work I can get here? Jennings said. Just to tide me over. There's always farm work. How about retail repair shops, garages, television? There's a TV repair shop down the street. Maybe you might get something from there. You could try. Farm work pays good. They can't get many men more. Most men are in the military. You want to pitch hay? Jennings laughed. He paid for his coffee. Not very much, but thanks. Once in a while, some of the men go up the road and work. There's some sort of government station. Jennings nodded. He pushed the screen door open stepping outside into the hot sidewalk. He walked aimlessly for a time, deep in thought, turning his nebulous plan over and over. It was a good plan. It would solve everything, all his problems at once. But right now it hinged on one thing, finding Rethrick Construction. 
and he had only one clue, if it really was a clue. The ticket stub folded and creased in his pocket, and a faith that he, the old he, had known what he was doing. The government station. Jennings paused, looking around him. Across the street was a taxi stand, a couple of cabbies sitting in their cabs, smoking and reading the newspaper. It was worth a try, at least. There wasn't much else to do. Rethrick would be something else on the surface. If it posed as a government project, no one would ask any questions. They were all too accustomed to government projects working without explanation in secrecy. He went over to the first cab. Mister, he said, can you tell me something? The cabbie looked up. What do you want? They tell me there's work to be had out at the government station. Is that right? The cabbie studied him. He nodded. What kind of work is it? I don't know. Where do they do the hiring? I don't know. The cabbie lifted his paper. Thanks. Jennings turned away. They don't do hiring. Maybe once in a long while. They don't take many on. You better go someplace else if you're looking for work. The other cabbie leaned out of his cab. They use only a few day laborers, buddy. That's all. And they are very choosy. They don't hardly let anybody in. Jennings pricked up his ears. They come into town and pick up a load of construction workers. Maybe a truck full. That's all. They're real careful who they pick. Jennings walked back toward the cabbie. Is that right? It's a big place. Steel wall. Charged. Guards. Work going on day and night. But nobody gets in. Set up on top of a hill. Out old Henderson Road. About two and a half miles. The cabbie poked his shoulder. You can't get in unless you're identified. They identify their laborers after they pick them out, you know. Jennings stared at him. The cabbie was tracing a line on his shoulder. Suddenly, Jennings understood. A flood of relief rushed over him. Sure, he said. I understand what you mean. At least I think so. He reached into his pocket, bringing out the four trinkets. Carefully, he unfolded the strip of green cloth, holding it up. Like this? The cabbies stared at the cloth. Yeah, that's right, one of them said slowly, staring at the cloth. Where did you get it? He put the cloth back in his pocket. A friend gave it to me. He went off back toward the inner city field. He had plenty to do, now that the first step was over. Rethrick was here, all right, and apparently the trinkets were going to see him through. One for every crisis. A pocket full of miracles from someone who knew the future. But the next step couldn't be done alone. He needed help. Somebody else was needed for this part. But who? He pondered, entering the inner city waiting room. There was only one person he could possibly go to. It was a long chance, but he had to take it. If the Rethrick plant was here, then Kelly would be too. You have been listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of Paycheck by Philip K. Dick. Part 1 of 3. Performed by Miranda Johnson. Thank you for listening.